When someone's body can no longer perform its functions in the natural world, then we say that the individual has died. The person, though, has not died at all, because we're not people because of our bodies, but because of our spirits. When we die, we simply move from one world into another. I have not only been told how the awakening happens, I've been shown by first-hand experience. I was brought into a state like the state of people who are dying. I noticed that my physical breathing was almost suspended with a deeper breathing, a breathing of the spirit continuing along with a very slight and silent physical one. At first then, a connection was established between my heartbeat and the heavenly kingdom because that kingdom corresponds to the human heart. I also saw angels from that kingdom, some at a distance, but two sitting close to my head. I remained in this state for several hours. Then the spirits who were around me gradually drew away, thinking that I was dead. I sensed a sweet odor like that of an embalmed body, for when heavenly angels are present, anything having to do with a corpse smells sweet. If evil spirits smell it, they cannot come near. The angels who were sitting beside my head were silent, simply sharing their thoughts with mine. They accomplished this sharing of thoughts by looking into my face. Later it felt like the deeper levels of my mind were being drawn out, like my spirit was being pulled from my body. When heavenly angels are present with the revived, they do not leave them. But if our soul is such that we can no longer enjoy the company of heavenly angels, we long to get away from them, at which point spiritual angels arrive and give us the gift of light. It seemed as though the angels rolled back a covering from my left eye toward the center of my nose so that my eye was opened and able to see. As this covering seemed to be rolled back, I could see a kind of clear but dim light, like the light we see through our eyelids when we're first waking up. After that, it felt as though something were being rolled gently off my face, and once this was done, I had access to spiritual thought. This rolling something off the face is an appearance, for it represents the fact that we are moving from natural thinking to spiritual thinking. Angels then tell the individual that he or she is a spirit. Okay, wait, wait, wait. What was that? What did I just watch? And what does that thing have to do with kayaking, comfortable spaces, and oil lamps? Stay tuned to find out. Tonight we're looking at what it feels like to die. And I want to start with an example, because let's say that I wanted to know, what's it feel like to jump into the Northern Atlantic Ocean in February? You wouldn't pull that together from a mosaic of pre-existing experiences. Like I wouldn't say, well, I know what jumping feels like, and I know what cold feels like, and I know what water feels like, so if I calculate the three, now you would go talk to somebody from the Coney Island Polar Bear Club, because there are some people that, that do this stuff for fun. You would want to talk to somebody who's been through the experience, right? Well, what you saw to open up the show was a firsthand account from 1758 by Emanuel Swedenborg, spiritual polar bear. But what he was going through was the dying process. So what does it feel like to die? It's, it's actually not that bad. I mean, it's, it's devastating for those of us who have to stay here and get left behind. But as you saw in the video, when we're actually going through it, death is just moving from one world into another. And what Swedenborg found, uh, and what many have found through their experiences, is that in that process, we actually find love, order, and continuity. And we're going to take you through all three of those, but let's look at these two first. We find love because God is love, and God is in this process. And that, that love shows up for us in that we're cared for both on the long-term level, our welfare is looked after, but even our experience going moment to moment through the process. But you also have this order because God is not just love. God is love 
and wisdom. And the wisdom is what structures the process and makes it effective. So what we want to do first is we're going to look at a modern near-death experience account and put it side by side with Swedenborg's account and see if we can find this love and this order operating in this process. Okay, so we're looking for love and we're looking for wisdom. And to do that, we're going to side by side compare two accounts that were published 243 years apart. So for the love side, what are we looking at? We're going to look at a story called To Heaven and Back by Mary C. Neal. This is a near-death experience story and it, it has a lot of wonderful detail about how it feels, how the process feels, and it's, it's interesting to compare that to what Swedenborg reports. Yeah, and we're going to pair that with Swedenborg's accounts, which can be a little bit light on the emotion side, but are awesome at delivering the framework mm -hmm. of why is Mary going through what she went through. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's start with just a couple of similarities uh, between the two. Swedenborg talks about this weird detail that sometimes when you die, you have this short period of time where you're still in your body, but your body's dead, but you're alive, and you actually know it. This is from heaven and hell. I've heard from heaven that some people who die before they've been revived are still thinking in their cold bodies and cannot help but feel that they're alive, but with the difference that they cannot move a single part of the matter that makes up their bodies. But, so, uh, am I dead? Uh, I don't think I'm dead, right? <laughs> that can sound like, oh, is that creepy? But I think in many NDE stories, there's something like that, like a person is at first, before they go through a tunnel or to another environment, they're hovering above their physical body or they're next to it, and they're somehow in the vicinity of their physical body and seeing that it is very lifeless, and yet here they are, very alive and sensing and thinking and feeling. Even though the body's going through this, this terrible distress, we're not feeling that. Uh, and Swedenborg talks uh, in True Christianity, he writes, when we suffer physically, our soul doesn't suffer, it merely feels distress. Yeah, and in that quote, he's not actually talking about somebody who's dying, he's just talking about when we go through hard things during life. But I think for a person who is actually starting the dying process, there's a whole, uh, force of protectiveness that's being attracted to the situation. And so they have um, much more, since they're focusing so much on their spirit now instead of their body, they're not feeling the pain or the distress that would be associated with what the body's going through. If you guys want to hear us talk about that sort of stuff more, we have actually two shows you might like. One is How Angels Take Care of Us When We Die. And then we did another one called Does It Hurt to Die? So. What happened, for those who aren't familiar, what happened to Mary? What's Mary's story? Well, she was kayaking with friends and they were going over a waterfall and she went over a waterfall, but unfortunately she got trapped underneath the fall and, and got pinned down by the force of the water and she couldn't get out. And she says she had always had a fear of drowning. Um, so there she was trapped under the water. She was trying to get out of the kayak, but right. couldn't. And you would think, Worst case scenario, she must be in complete panic, but she turned her mind to God, and then this is what she writes. She says she was filled with an absolute feeling of calm, peace, and of the very physical sensation of being held in someone's arms while being stroked and comforted. I also experienced an absolute certainty that everything would be okay, regardless of the outcome. So no pain, no fear, comfort. Well, and that, so emotionally, that makes sense. Well, in the context of a loving God who runs the universe, that you'd yeah. think, wow, this thing that we thought, and this is the story of all spirituality, I feel like. This thing that we thought was terrifying and, and, and bleak and, and catastrophic is actually loving and ordered and, and you're taken care of. So emotionally, it makes sense that you need to be comforted right then. But what's the mechanism, what's the process by which that's happening? Here we get to some of the order, because Swedenborg talks about these phases that you go through in the dying process, or these stages, and the, the first one, you're surrounded by heavenly or celestial, or the highest, deepest angels, and that part of what they do is surround you with peace and love through, through their aura or through, through their care, and they protect you from anything negative or fearful or evil. So that is most likely what, how Mary got to feeling what she's feeling, right? Yeah, exactly. 
So she stayed in her body at first, in her physical body, and she was aware of her physical body in the water, even could kind of feel the water running past it and everything. But she felt no pain, she felt calm. She felt her body stop trying to breathe, but that was not a panicky situation. It was fine, and she assumed she would die. Yeah, and so how can you not panic about not breathing anymore? But in the video that started this episode, we had Swedenborg talk about the physical breathing going just about dormant, but this spiritual breathing starting up. So it's not that we're not breathing, we're just breathing in a new way. And maybe that's happening with Mary too. Yeah, yeah. And as far as her emotions, um, she began to think about her family, but again, instant comfort came because she writes, she was deeply and profoundly assured that they would be okay even if I died. Even though that's, it's a nice thing for her to hear, but why are these, whatever, whoever she's with, why are they trying so hard to make her feel okay? There's, there is something important about that state of mind for the transition process. Swedenborg writes that uh, in heaven and hell, angels take the greatest care to shield the awakening person from any concept that does not taste of love. That there's something about, it's a nice thing to do, but being in that state allows this complex transition to happen. Yeah, it's very important. So Mary was in her body, calm, in no pain. She started to think over her life, and she says she even started to feel a little bit bored. Like, okay, I, I'd like to move on with things now. I'd like the process to continue. <laughs> Which is so funny, and it seems like that's the way it is for everyone, there is some self-directed steps there. Swedenborg talks about us showing up in the world of spirits and angels that are all around and they say, don't you want to hang out and party with us and we, we're never going to let you go. But we can get to a point where we're feeling a little bit like, I'm a little smothered here. I need to get out and do something else. We do have some agency in our progression. Yeah, the next thing happens when you're ready for it to happen. Right. So Mary finally felt her physical body being pulled out of the kayak by the current of the water, and she was even aware of bones breaking in her legs, which sounds horrible, yeah. and yet she was not disturbed by that. She felt no right. pain and no distress. She still felt blissful and unafraid. And this is what she writes, while my body was being slowly sucked out of the boat, I felt as though my soul was slowly peeling itself away from my body. I felt my body release from the boat and begin to tumble with the current. At the moment my body was released and began to tumble, I felt a pop. It felt as if I had finally shaken off my heavy outer layer, freeing my soul. That, that is such a funny little quirk that you, you there's a moment of separation, like objects separating, but yeah. shows indicates to me that these are objects. The, 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 and Swedenborg is yeah. adamant about spirits are real, they have substance, so we're actually seeing a, a, a separating uh, yeah. of things. It's not just a, um, you know, okay, they're apart. How do they come apart? It's like this sense of being pulled out of the body described in our opening video, this two objects, a spiritual and a physical object, separating. Swedenborg describes it uh, in Secrets of Heaven. As soon as the internal organs of the body grow cold, our living substances wherever they're located, are separated out. This would happen even if they were lost in the thousand interlinking passages of a labyrinth. The Lord's mercy, which I've already experienced as a living and powerful pull, is so strong that it could not leave any living element behind. So it's, a, it's almost like a, a love vacuum. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. So Mary's spirit exits her body, rises up out of the water, and then there, kind of up in the air, she sees this crowd of people, spiritual people coming to greet her. And she says, the joy was amazing. They Im immediately started to telepathically communicate. And the sensation of the whole experience was way more vivid than earthly sensation, she says. And the joy was um, more joy than is possible to feel on earth and also, more than is possible to describe <laughs> with earthly language, which is what Swedenborg ran into a lot when trying to describe heaven. Yeah, that's right. And uh, if you are looking for a little more of the human side of the story that Swedenborg tells, the emotional side, we did do a show called Five Reunions in the Afterlife, which goes into that a bit more. So then, but where does, uh, where does Mary go from here? So she is aware of being above the water and she's looking back at her physical body. And this is what she writes about that. My body looked like the shell of a comfortable old friend, and I felt warm compassion and gratitude for its use. And then she felt her soul being 
pulled towards this magnificent hall and it was an amazing looking place and ex it exuded this aura of absolute unconditional love. Both of those aspects, like her attitude toward her body and that pull that you're talking about fit into the matrix that, that Swedenborg creates. Swedenborg talked to some people in the afterlife and was basically relaying to them, hey, your funeral is going on. This is what he wrote. I've talked with some just two days after their deaths and told them that now their funerals and burial rites were being performed so that they could be interred, to which they responded that it was a good thing that they had cast off what served them as a body for their functions in our world, wanting me to say that they were not dead at all. They were just as alive and just as human as ever, having simply crossed over from one world into another. So it's not, they're not horrified that their body is gone, but they're also not dismissive of it. They say, this was useful for me mm -hmm. in the world. Just like Mary's not saying, come back body, but she's saying, th you know, thanks old friend. Mm -hmm. And, but then also um, that pull that she felt. Swedenborg talks about this constant force that pulls everyone into heaven. He says, there's a kind of field that constantly emanates from the Lord, which pulls all toward heaven. It fills the entire spiritual world and the entire physical world. It's like a strong current in the ocean that secretly carries ships along. So this is a universal thing. Like gravity here is, is pulling on everything all the time. And it's a field. It's a thing. It's not just a, you know, a, a, um, a detail of experience. That This is something you could potentially measure with instruments if you had the right spiritual instruments. So this is not subjective to Mary's experience. Like, okay, you're in this situation, somebody throw together a way to pull her in. This is a system that spreads across time and, and applies to, to everybody. Yeah, it's very real. And then um, sadness descends on the whole group because it is being realized that it's not Mary's time to cross over yet. Um, all this time her friends have been working to revive her physical body and she keeps being kind of pulled in that, back in that direction. And she and her spiritual friends there are realizing at the same time that uh, it's not time yet. And it's a little bit of a downer because they had been so joyful to be together. Um, so Mary goes back and she's kind of sad to leave that beautiful scene, but she knows she'll be back. And um, she has no fear of dying because death was nothing to dread. She experienced that death felt absolutely wonderful. So everything we talked about there, but especially that thing at the end, if, if death is nothing to be afraid of, what makes you not afraid of something? Well, you know that it doesn't hurt and that there's a purpose to it. And this is where we see that love and that order, both in Swedenborg's descriptions from hundreds of years ago, and then Mary Neal's from just a couple of years ago. I think we're, we're here finding a universal flavor to the whole thing. So those are going on and that's great, but it's a means to get somewhere. So where are we headed? after that. Now we're going to look a little bit at this continuity side of it. What's it like to go from living on one plane of existence to another? I'm here in our office kitchen, which for me is a familiar and comfortable place. And Swedenborg learned that when anyone crosses over, every effort is made to make their transition feel comfortable so it's not shocking or overwhelming. In our show, What Happens Immediately After You Die, we talk about how when everyone crosses over, people are welcomed by the highest angels that have the most love. So we're enveloped in this love and then we're shown these beautiful heavenly states and scenes. But for most of us, our mind and heart isn't really up or open to that level yet. And so that time actually feels kind of like a dream. But so Swedenborg learned that then after two or three days, he even says, then our consciousness comes back from that higher state into the one that is like what we were like before we died. And that's the point when our spiritual journey continues. He writes, during the first days after they die, all people fail to realize they are not still alive in the same world they were in before. That the intervening time is like a period of sleep. When they wake up from it, they feel as though they are just where they used to be. So, but this doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna wake up in the actual physical circumstances that we died in, but rather that our surroundings, when we do wake up from that beautiful dream, will feel familiar and comfortable. When we arrive after death in the spiritual world, which generally happens on the third day after we have breathed our last, it seems to us that we have a life similar to the one we had in the world, 
living in a similar house, room, and bedroom, with similar dress and clothing, and with similar company at home. A monarch or ruler will be in a similar court with magnificent surroundings. A farm worker will be in a similar farmhouse with rural surroundings. The reason this happens to all of us after death is so that death does not seem like death, but a continuation of life. And so the state we are in at the end of earthly life becomes the state that we are in at the beginning of spiritual life. That is so cool. <laughs> Sorry, but to think about, think about the afterlife. Don't you, you picture it as this sort of conceptual, nothing black and white. To see it in color with that much detail, to think about these people starting their spiritual journey from the, you know, the state of life that they left, but knowing the possibilities that are ahead. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit revved up about that. So you see that there's this continuity of life situation, but there's actually another aspect to the continuity. But actually, hold that thought for just a second, because we need to clear up something around end-of-life situation, because I could see somebody thinking, well, you sort of come back into life uh, in a similar situation to the way you left it, and it's all well and good for those people who are in a field or, you know, thinking and writing, but what if, what if you have a terrible end of life? What if you get murdered or something like that? Will you wake up in the horrific surroundings that you left life from? So it's important to put the distinction here because what's driving this are universal spiritual principles and what's driving or, or really setting the tone for your afterlife experience is your will. That the people who are come into similar situations that they were in earth, that's because that's the kind of thing that's in their heart. So it's your will that sets it, not the will of somebody else's. So if somebody's doing something to you that isn't part of, of what you want or what you're freely choosing, that doesn't stick spiritually. It can, for the person committing the act, actually Swedenborg uh, has a couple of accounts of someone who had murdered somebody else actually meeting the person that they had killed and the murderer was terrified by the experience because they had to confront what they had done and, and people knew that they had killed this person but the person who had been murdered w wasn't really faced by it and wasn't wasn't super upset but also wasn't just just had this peaceful attitude about the whole thing. And elsewhere in his journal, uh, number 1260 to 1266, there's this more drawn out story of someone who had killed somebody else by poisoning them and then was in, the, and then had died themselves and was in the afterlife, not only feeling the guilt of that, but couldn't stop plotting similar nefarious deeds against other innocent people in public because they had made that a part of their life by doing it. While the person who had been poisoned, Swedenborg talked to them, and they, they said, yeah, I, I, I was killed by that person over there, but, you know, maybe it was for the best. Who knows what it would have, I would have gotten into in my life if, if I hadn't, you know, been brought to the spiritual world here. So this is amazing amount of peace and acceptance from that person. Nothing anybody else does is going to mess up your afterlife or, or taint it. This process is about you, and it's about getting to the places that our, that our own heart is leading us. So to take that to a less dramatic example, you think about that dream, pleasant dream-like state that Chelsea was referencing where you're surrounded by these highest angels. Those are kind of like the first responders and they, they do come and induce that on you. But everything from there on out is dictated by, by what you want or what you're willing to participate in. Because Swedenborg talks about people who can't really hang with those angels for too long, so they want, want to back off and go to some people who are a little more like themselves and then move on from there. It's really our own will that sets the tone and, and the direction for all this stuff. Okay, so you don't got to worry about somebody else setting the conditions for your afterlife. All right, back to continuity. So the other side to continuity is spiritual growth continuity. Because you think of all the effort and time we put in or say we're putting in to try to become better people, not do the stuff that hurts other people, that actually has a huge impact on our afterlife experience. We can set ourselves up to be receptors of heavenly joy and heavenly peace. So how do we use this life on earth to prepare ourselves for this reception of heavenly peace and happiness? And how do we allow that to grow? So the thing is that God and heaven want to pour endless joy and happiness into every single person forever. 
that's what they're constantly trying to do, just radiating that joy and happiness. The thing is, what about our receptivity? Do we have the capacity for that? Are we going to be receptive of that after we die and come into that atmosphere of greater joy and happiness? Swedenborg says this is actually what Jesus is talking about in that interesting parable of the 10 young women in the Bible in Matthew 25. There are these 10 young women and apparently their function in the wedding is that they're to carry these lamps. And an ancient lamp would be like a clay uh, vessel and then you pour oil into it and it has a spout and you light the spout and then this beautiful light comes forth. So the parable says that five of these young women were wise and five of them were foolish. And what separated the wise from the foolish was that the wise had oil already in their lamps and the foolish didn't. So the bridegroom comes at midnight, surprises everybody. And the ones that have no oil are suddenly panicking and saying to the ones who have oil, can I have your oil? And they're saying, well, I don't know if I have enough. And so they say, why don't you go out and buy some? And while they're out trying to find it frantically, then the door closes and the wedding happens without them. Kind of a crushing story in a way. So what, what is that all about? Well, what that story is about is that that lamp, that vessel is a picture of our entire kind of mental construct, our faith, our beliefs, the things that we think are true about reality and all that. So everybody has a lamp, but the lamps that have oil in them are the, are the constructs that have an idea of compassion, that have love for others, or the idea that we should be serving others and, and taking care of them and all that. Does our faith have love in it? Does it have compassion in it or not? If we have a harsh judgmental construct or some sort of philosophy that we are superior to everyone else and they should all be serving us or something, we may have an empty lamp right now, but the game's not over. There's still time on the clock. It's possible for us while we're still in this world to cultivate forgiveness, compassion, usefulness, mercy, kindness, those kind of qualities. And the more we have of that, the more capacity we'll have for heavenly joy, that joy that the Lord in heaven are seeking at every moment to pour into us. So it's enough in this world just to try to make a start. Now, you may be feeling like, oh, I'm trying, but I, I got some crazy personality from my heredity or something happened to me when I was a kid and I'm I just not getting very far with the joy thing, you know? Well, it's we're talking about the afterlife and what you come into in the afterlife. Swedenborg acknowledges that there are a lot of things in this world that can compromise our freedom of rationality or can just make it difficult for us to feel like we're getting very far in this world. But things that are just earthly or physical, barriers that are just in our way like that, Swedenborg says that they melt away at the time of death and he sees people rise up into this greater joy and freedom. The game's not over yet. The main thing we can work on is being kind to others so that we can develop that capacity for joy. So if you're trying, you can trust that it's making a difference, even if you don't necessarily get those results lining up. When we're talking about spiritual stuff, intention is what matters. So if we put that intention to try to continue to work, to improve, we can get this spiritual growth continuity that we're looking for. And so during these early stages, you can also get relational continuity because you, you're you going into this world that all the rest of the human race who's ever died is in and there's going to be some people there that you get to reunite with and that feels good. This is from Swedenborg's Heaven and Hell 494. I've heard many people who had just come from the world overjoyed to see their friends again and their friends overjoyed that they had arrived. And somewhere along the line here, you've got to learn that you've died. Some people put it together themselves, but other people need to be told about it. And since we've covered all of our sections here, great work everybody, we're going to give you a bonus section, which is what does it feel like to be told that you've died? 
Swedenborg witnessed a variety of emotions among people who had just arrived in the afterlife and were being told that they were in the afterlife. He described three general emotional responses. And the first one was among people who had refused to believe in an afterlife while they were on Earth and were also kind of greedy, materialistic kind of people. So this is what he wrote about that. A certain person appeared who was carried up to heaven. I was told that this was someone who had recently died and was being taken off immediately by angels into heaven. But although those spirits too saw this take place, now this is the greedy materialistic kind of spirits, they possessed an aura of disbelief which was an extremely powerful one and which they diffused around themselves. It was so powerful that they were willing to convince themselves and others not to believe what they had seen. So our minds remain devoted to our will, whether we're on earth or in the afterlife, and a stubborn will is a powerful thing. Now Swedenborg saw some other people who had arrived in the afterlife and they had not really believed in an afterlife while they were on earth, but they, they were basically good-hearted people and didn't have this really stubborn blockage to deal with. So this is what he wrote about them. Some people during their earthly lives have not believed in any life of the soul after the life of the body. When they discover that they are alive after death, they are profoundly embarrassed. But the most universal emotion of people who are in the afterlife are being told that they're in the afterlife are the emotions of amazement and joy. I have talked with some people on the third day after they died. They wanted me to tell their loved ones on earth that they were not dead but alive and were just as human now as ever. They said they had simply crossed over from one world into another and had no awareness of having lost anything, since they had a body and sensory faculties just as they had had before. They had understanding and will just as before. They had the same kinds of thoughts and feelings, the same kinds of sensations, even the same kinds of pleasures and desires as they had had in the world. Many who have just died on seeing that they are still people and still alive as they were before and in similar circumstances, are touched with a new joy at being alive and say they had not believed it would be like this. So how powerful and amazing is it to think about life going on like that and life as we know it, like this thing we're in right now, but with a difference in here, we're kind of locked into the sense of the temporary nature of life. I know it's going to end at this point and we have these sort of limitations. Oh, I can't get past this. I'll never be this. But there to have the same vehicle, but just know that there's endless possibility out there. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And there's another example that Swedenborg witnessed. This one was angels gently telling this group of newcomers that they were in the afterlife, and we'll get to hear what their reaction to that news was. When new arrivals to the spiritual world are in this first state, angels come to give them a warm welcome. The angels are amused by this first conversation with them, knowing that the newcomers have no idea that they are not still alive in the previous world. So the angels ask them what they think about life after death, and the newcomers answer in keeping with the ideas they had before. Some say they don't know. Some say there are spirits or ethereal beings. Some say there are diaphanous, airy bodies. Some say there are ghosts flitting in the ether and in the air, or in the water, or in the middle of the earth. Some say souls, like angels, dwell among the stars. Some of the newcomers deny that anyone lives after death. When they hear all this, the angels say, Welcome. We will show you something new, which you have not known and would never have believed before. Here it is. After death, everyone lives as a human being, in a body, just as in the previous life. At this, the newly arrived spirits retort, That is not possible. Where do the bodies come from? Aren't they lying dead in the grave with all their various parts? The angels respond with amusement and say, We'll demonstrate this before your eyes. Aren't you human beings in perfect form? 
Examine yourselves. Feel yourselves. Yet you have left the physical world. You've been unaware of this before now because the state of life immediately after death is exactly like the state of life just before death. The new arrivals are stunned at this and cry out with heartfelt joy. Thank God that we are alive and that death has not annihilated us. I have frequently heard newcomers being taught in this way about their life beyond the grave and being thrilled about their own resurrection. So what does it feel like to die? After all that, we found it feels like love, order, and continuity. We're going to have, on the other side, a body, a spiritual body that we're in. We're going to have encounters with other people. We're going to have surroundings. But all that stuff is going to feel so much more vivid and real than anything we've experienced here. And speaking of spiritual bodies, we'll dig into what it feels like to wake up in a spiritual body in our next episode, Will My Body Look the Same When I Die? We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. As a nonprofit, we depend on donor support to continue to create high quality programming. Any gift you give joins you to the central network of people in the world who make our work possible. You can deepen the significance of your gift by making it in memory or honor of someone special in your life. This could be done as a one-time gift, recurring monthly, or run as a special fundraiser for your circle of friends and family. Go to otle.causevox.com and follow the prompts to make a gift in whatever way is most meaningful for you. Your support helps the ideas in our content reach and nourish thousands of people every day around the globe. We couldn't do it without you. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through in this way, in the end, everybody wins.